Hello, everyone. Welcome to Art Power Hong Kong, a collaborative campaign from the Hong Kong art community celebrating the arts in Hong Kong in the year 2020. I'm Katie D. Tilly, Art Power Hong Kong working group member and owner of 10 Chancery Lane Gallery. And I'm delighted that you are joining us for the ninth installment of the weekly Art Power Hong Kong online talks program. Today's discussion looks at how Hong Kong's gallery sector is responding to COVID-19. Some of the innovative ways in which galleries are responding to the current challenges and looking at how the future of the art scene in Hong Kong will be reinvigorated through the power of a united art community. The conversation will also look at the development of Hong Kong's commercial art market and views on how the events of this last year will shape the future of the art market in Asia and globally. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Denise Choi, Managing Editor of Kobo Social and your moderator for today. She will introduce you to our esteemed fellow gallerists who will be in the talk. Thank you, Katie. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so I'm Denise Cho, Managing Editor for Kobo Social. I mainly write about art and curatorial practices and the art market. And firstly, I'll introduce our four fantastic speakers today. Uh, first up, we have Claudia Albertini, Director of Massimo de Carlo Gallery in Hong Kong. Uh, they also have spaces in London and Milan. And then we have Amanda Hong, Director of Ben Brown Fine Arts. Uh, who also have a space in London and recently in Hong Kong. They moved from Central to Wanchukan, so she'll be sharing a bit more about that. Uh, and then we have Willem Molesworth, director of the Sarth Gallery. Uh, in 2017, they moved their space to Wanchukang, um, and in the same year, they developed the, the Sarth Artist Residency. And then lastly, we have Johnson Chang, founder of Han Art Gallery which has been a prominent mainstay in the Hong Kong art scene for well over 30 years. And they've also just had a recent move, which he will share more about as well. Um, so in today's talk, we're going to be looking at some of the impacts of COVID-19 on the art business in Hong Kong, um, as a, especially as a city that has had a really tough 12 months. Um, just even before the pandemic hit, we've had a lot of events that led up to um, sudden closures and just difficulty in business. Um, and so together we want to look at thinking into the months ahead, how do we move forward from here as a community? And we want to contemplate what the next normal for the Hong Kong art scene may constitute. Uh, lastly, we have a chat box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions along the way, please do drop us a line. We'll try to answer some of these at the end. Uh, so with that said, firstly, I'd like to put forward a question to all of our speakers. In your experience running a gallery, which has, seen, which has been through some unique and unforeseen challenges, what are some of these challenges that you have faced during this pandemic and how are you dealing with these challenges? Um, if we could start with Johnson first. Um, um, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for coming onto this uh, chat room. Um, I have just actually moved my gallery uh, from Pedda building to our um, experimental space which is in Kwai Chung. And uh, I think uh, the, for me, the most uh, creative thing we can do at the moment is to hibernate. And in this hibernation, try to find some um, new footing for this new age. I, I think um, COVID-19, although it's been, um, been a lockdown and it's been terrible in terms of business for most people um, and tragic for some others, Hong Kong actually has been very lucky because um, those struck by uh, the epidemic are relatively small in number. But, um, but it certainly has changed the whole gallery culture. And uh, it certainly has forced me to go onto Zoom, for example, and digital platform. And I think this is um, a, a really good practice run for people like me who uh, have always um, um, felt inept in dealing with digital platforms. But what it really means is that now um, we, we all need to deal with new social spaces. And, uh, and this occasion forces us to, be to, uh, to have a test run and uh, to work out this new social space, especially the digital social space. 
So um, I think moving away from central for us, of course, um, well, we, are, we are retreating from being physically on the front line. But on the other hand, I think um, it, is, uh, it offers uh, more room for preparing to go forward in new ways. Are you currently exploring any virtual initiatives for the gallery in specific? Well, it's been something that's in my mind for a long time, but uh, um, now we're forced to try to put some of this into reality. Uh, I've always found it very difficult to navigate uh, something with a, with a mouse. So this cat and mouse business now uh, has become quite critical. So, uh, well, I, I'm exploring. This is one of the things I'm trying to explore why I'm hibernating, apart from trying to figure out what I've done. Um, since over the years, every gallery has accumulated stock, um, especially galleries which support new artists and you're uh, collecting from them. And uh, eventually one forgets what, what has not been in circulation sometimes. So I think um, um, COVID-19 uh, has been good in uh, getting everybody to um, bring things up to date, bring, th bring things up to date in a way that uh, things which were not up to date, in fact, could be current. So, so it, it's a new way of rethinking um, what is available as art material. Then, of course, I think for lockout periods, it's, it's, it's the best time, if your salary is not affected, it's the best time to do creative work. You're, you have more private space, you're more private, well, you have more private time, um, you have um, more room to yourself, um, and I think for artists, it should be a very good time for creativity. So um, it has not been good for people who have to carry very heavy overheads, but it's not bad for everybody. Okay, Claudia, should we move to you next? Um, because you guys have just opened a new Lee Kit exhibition. Um, would you be able to share a bit more about this show and how it came about and also the new VR platform you've got? Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Hi, everybody. So first of all, I think that uh, it's actually amazing that we are uh, on this uh, Zoom platform, but I'm able to share the same space uh, with Johnson that, uh, you know, like is still giving a kind of hope that things will probably try to go back to a sort of new normal. Um, yes, the Gallery of, in Hong Kong, Massimo de Carlo in Hong Kong, has uh, reopened to the public with an exhibition by Likit that, uh, um, was, uh, that came on on uh, May 14th. The same day, we launched the exhibition also in our virtual gallery. So talking about the challenges and the way of dealing with the challenges, uh, Massimo de Carlo Gallery has uh, launched this platform already uh, since uh, April 14. It was actually an idea that uh, we were discussing since probably last September. Uh, obviously, we didn't know that this would happen, but it was an idea to, to have a fifth space, a space that will not be physical, but a space that will be virtual. Uh, therefore, it seemed uh, quite appropriate to open up this space exactly when, when it was more needed. Uh, the chance to have the uh, Likit exhibition here at the gallery uh, in Hong Kong uh, has been amazing. And uh, I'm really grateful to the artists that uh, gave us this opportunity. Uh, and it's also even more fantastic the fact that uh, the exhibition can be seen uh, by anybody wherever they are. Uh, there is uh, maybe just a little difference uh, between the gallery, the exhibition in the gallery and the one on this space simply because the technology, no matter how much is advanced, still cannot uh, totally reproduce uh, what we see um, in reality. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is what happening, what's happening here in Hong Kong, but talking in general about Massimo Di Carlo Gallery, of course, we have been uh, uh, sadly hit very heavily, first in Hong Kong and then slowly in Italy, as most of you know, as well in London. But the good news is also that uh, the offices in Milan have opened again this week and the gallery will open again to the public by the end of this month. Um, 
the same hopefully is going to happen very soon to the London level. So what, ha what has been the um, response so far like for the VR platform? Uh, we receive a very positive response. Uh, the first uh, show, the first project that was launched was an exhibition of John Mader and Rob Pruitt. That was the one launched on April 14. Uh, we had uh, many visitors, so we had very good feedback. And uh, for those that have the chance to experience uh, this virtual um, reality with the Oculus, so that is this object that uh, is also available here at the gallery, is is actually amazing. Like I would have never told myself that the technology could have brought us in such a different dimension. Mm -hmm. I personally see a very traditional person, and I love to see things and be able, you know, like to perceive with all my senses. But once you, you wear this Oculus, or you enter even to our website in a larger screen, is is better suggested. Is uh, is totally impressive. I do not think that uh, we are ready for that to uh, take uh, over uh, the actual physical space. Luckily, I, I still like, uh, believe that is important for gallery to exist, to better uh, represent and, and, uh, and show uh, the artist's artwork. But it's definitely an alternative that becomes uh, very useful and very important in a scenario like the one we are now. I have to say, I've seen both the leakage show in real life and also played around with the virtual platform. It's definitely a lot of fun. Now, with the virtual platform you guys have, Claudia, are you, are you, is your gallery planning to continue this to come some capacity as an ongoing initiative? Yes, we are. So, um, as I mentioned, that would be our fifth space. So, we have two galleries in Milano, one in London, one in Hong Kong, and B space is our fifth gallery. Uh, the program uh, would be different. Uh, we just uh, communicated that throughout the summer we are going to uh, give hand over uh, this space to um, six galleries in Milan that in turn uh, will take over. Each of them will be between uh, 10 and, and 2 weeks of time. That's also uh, a chance to share and to give uh, um, an opportunity to uh, maybe smaller uh, businesses that uh, are suffering as much as we are, but have maybe less chances to be uh, able to use alternatives. So I think that is very generous, as other colleagues in the in the field are doing in other ways to give the opportunity uh, to our colleagues. After the summer, we will start again, and there will be um, a program, like as uh, it is another gallery space. So there is a. Uh, if, even if everything is slowing down, there is an increase of, uh, of workload for us, which I think that uh, psychologically speaking is also uh, quite, uh, quite good to keep our mood up and see that uh, no matter uh, the current pandemic, we, we still need to work. Yeah, I'm certainly seeing, um, I would definitely agree about the uh, new workload that we're all picking up now that we have more online and more digital things. Um, and absolutely, um, with this pandemic and the last few months, I've also seen definitely a lot more collaborations and people helping each other out, people coming together. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, ask Willem next, because with your situation, it was uh, with, the art, uh, with the cancellation of Art Basel Hong Kong, you guys had a work in Encounters that was commissioned for Andrew Luck at the time. Uh, would you be able to share a bit more about the challenges you faced during this cancellation and immediately and how you changed that? And now the work is on view at the gallery and also as a virtual installation online. And also how did this alter the gallery's original programming that you had? Yeah. Um, well, first, thanks, everyone. It's, it's great to be chatting with you all. And uh, thanks, Our Power uh, HK, for, for hosting this and bringing us together in this way, um, in this moment where it's a challenge for us to gather in, in person. Um, yeah, we, we, we pivoted our program quite significantly uh, in response to the challenges here. Um, we had, like you said, originally planned to show this very large installation in uh, the prominent kind of public art sector of Art Basel Hong Kong. 
Um, and it was produced by an artist who works locally here in Hong Kong named uh, Andrew Brooke. And um, we made the decision to show that as well as a painting by Chu De Chun, um, another artist we work closely with and that we were planning to show in our Basel, um, in our gallery space, um, instead of showing it at the fair and instead of showing the show that we had originally planned for our gallery um, for a Shanghai based artist named Wang Xin. Um, we made that decision for a number of reasons. Um, in part because our artist in Shanghai just logistically could not get the artwork to us in time. Um, you know, the supply chain broke down, right? Shipping became a real issue. So um, we had to think on our feet and we decided to just bring what we physically had on hand, which was the work we had prepared for the fair, um, and show that in the gallery instead. Um, it was a, a lot of work and it took kind of resizing and rethinking the installation itself because um, unlike our Basel Hong Kong, our gallery, um, does not have 15 meter ceilings. We have like four meter ceilings, right? Which is still good by gallery standards here, but, but not the same by any means. Um, so it, it took some reworking, but uh, it, it ended up being very good for us. Um, I think a lot of people appreciated the effort we made. Um, the fact that it was a local artist meant the local community could rally around him. Um, and, and all the while we were able to do this um, because Hong Kong was never officially shut down, we were always able to stay open um, as long as we kind of stuck to certain guidelines, which we did. Um, when we had our opening for that show, for example, um, instead of doing a two hour opening, we did a seven hour opening, which was exhausting, but worth it, right? Um, we limited the amount of people in the gallery at any one time. Um, we were doing temperature checks, health declaration forms and what have you. Um, and, and through this process, we, we were able to get over a hundred people in the gallery. I think it was 111. Um, on that opening day. And then a week later for the South Island Art Day, when a bunch of galleries in Wachukong's kind of South Side District, we had even more people come into the gallery on, on, a, on a single day, um, which has been good. And, and I think uh, very, very kind of positive development. Yeah. So with your, um, with your online initiative, is that something you guys will be going, continuing going forward? Right, so we um, uh, worked with a company called Easel um, to take our exhibition and kind of do a 3D virtual tour of it. Um, and uh, Claudia said this earlier, it's great, you know, people internationally can, can experience the artwork. Before that, I was coming in at like 9 and 8 a.m. with curators from the States to give them like a FaceTime walkthrough, which is like, I mean, great, I guess, but also kind of silly. Um, you know, these are some of the things we have to do now, I guess, but... but. Um, with the virtual exhibition, people can, whenever they want, access it online and kind of walk around and see the space. But this installation that was for Encounters is kinetic. It's a large moving mobile. And so the VR capture actually doesn't do a good job capturing that kinetic energy at all. So there's a video we've embedded into it, but that's just yet another kind of click and, you know, altered experience. So I think these, uh, these, these new kind of viewing rooms and online platforms are interesting and important for now and they're going to make a big difference for all of us to get through this but um i think it, it's more of a supplemental kind of development in the long term as opposed to a significant radical shift that will be permanent okay amanda we might move to you next um you moved your gallery from central to wong Han just only a couple of months ago i remember it was during the let's see the height of the virus in hong kong what were some of the challenges you faced during this move? Um, it was, I mean, we were discussing with the landlords over at Petter for quite a while. Um, so obviously my gallery was right next to Claudia's gallery, right below Johnson's gallery. Um, and all of us have been discussing our leases with the landlord because of the protest, because of COVID. Um, and we were unable to reach an agreement However, luckily, we found a space in Wong Chuk Hang right now that's four times the size. Um, in this kind of environment where, where I think everyone is, is suffering a bit, um, I'd rather donate or give my resources, my monetary resources to my staff and my artists, as opposed to the landlords, if I can, because at the end of the day, it's your staff and your artists that make up the gallery, not the location of the gallery. And if you have good art, collectors will come. Um, the space that we currently have, 
right now is, as I mentioned, four times the size. So it allows for our artists to be a lot more creative. It allows for um, us to bring more works in um, and the artists to do installations if they, if they wish to, which we couldn't do in Petter due to the logistics and due to the size of the space. Um, the move here was, it didn't take us that long. I think it was like a, a week, a week, yeah, a week. Um, I don't even think I was here when they moved because I was in New York for the armory. Knock on wood, I didn't get COVID. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but it took the girls a week. And currently in your new space, um, you're presenting a solo exhibition of Rosamond Brown's watercolors. Uh, at your new space and also at the Hong Kong Club. And with this, it's, it's quite special because half the proceeds go to the, a charity that's designated by the artist. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about the decision behind to do this? So uh, the Hong Kong Club had approached Rosamond, who happens to be Ben's mother um, and happens also be, to be an artist, to do an exhibition at their space. Um, we, Rosamond's uh, exhibition isn't technically opened here yet, uh, give us a few more days. <laughs> uh, the works are here. So if you want to come and see, the works are definitely here. They're just not hung. Um, uh, yeah, and Rosamond just really wanted to do this. She's giving, she's looking for a charity right now that donates masks to the elderly um, in Hong Kong. So it's a, it's a cause that's dear to her heart. She obviously came here in 67 and she's lived between here and um, the UK all her life. Ben was born here, so Hong Kong is, is really where she calls home. I really love that because for me, it, it, it just adds to what art can actually bring to communities too. Um, so I'm gonna jump in here. We actually do have a, a question that I think is for everybody from one of our listeners. Um, and they want to know, will many of Hong Kong's exhibitions be postponed to late summer or the last quarter of 2020 if all goes well with COVID-19 or have many shows been simply cancelled? Um, so I'd like to put that forward for each of you guys, respective to your galleries. Um, maybe Willem? Um, that's a bit of a tricky question. Um, we, we have postponed. This exhibition is about 50% longer than our exhibitions would normally be. Um, and uh, we, we plan on kind of resuming our, our normal programming in, um, in September. Um, and then the show that we would have done in March of this year will be happening in March of next year. Um, so uh, I think everything should be back to normal. Hong Kong here, like Johnson said, we've, we've been doing very well. Um, and, and I'm confident that uh, it will continue to be like this. Um, and we'll be able to reopen and perhaps we won't have as many international visitors, but um, I think, I think we'll be able to program as usual after the summer. Oh, me? Okay, I can go. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, we've had to redo our, um, our exhibition schedule because of what we can possibly ship. It's all based on logistics. I mean, uh, I think for, especially for me and Claudia, a lot of our stock is not in Hong Kong. It's, it's uh, in London or it's in America. Uh, so that requires a little bit of time. <laughs> um, right now, it seems that Hong Kong's doing really well uh, as far as the number of cases are concerned. Um, life hopefully seems to be getting back to some level of normalcy. Um, but again, it's the rest of the world is where our stock is mostly, and that needs to get shipped here. Uh, so we're doing the best that we can. We are open. Uh, we might not have what you want to see, but we have good works. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe Claudia and Johnson. <laughs> well, I think you know the the, the most important. Um, step that we try to take here is not to cancel the show so uh, we juggle like uh, rearrange our uh, program of course uh, and we try to postpone as William said and uh, Amanda is doing and uh, yes uh, the, the idea our hope is to be able to um, 
have our next exhibition, uh, main exhibition uh, opening in September. We are working towards that. Uh, as I just pointed out, it's all in the hands of logistic. Uh, whether artworks can be moved, uh, can be moved to a reasonable uh, price because uh, of course with the decrease of number of aircraft, uh, prices are going up and, uh, and it gets pretty uh, challenging to uh, accept certain costs uh, to have uh, uh, the works here. I want to be very positive about it. I think that if we all continue to uh, do like what is right to do in terms of like pay attention and, uh, and behave in the right way um, and other countries uh, hopefully will also follow this, uh, uh, we should be able to resume with, uh, with our program uh, soon after the summer. Well, uh, Hanan has just moved, and we are on Hanan Gallery is in boxes at the moment. <laughs> so we hope to open the first show uh, end of June, and um, because of the protests last year and the um, pandemic this year, um, it's actually given me new ideas of what shows to, to make. So I'm trying to respond to partly to um, what we can do, and uh, and also trying to think through. What sort of things would be interesting? But the immediate, immediate show I'm curating uh, for the end of June, I'm calling it Moving. I've just moved from Pedagogy um, across the harbor to the other side. So we're doing a moving show and I'm trying to put together things which can be fun and can, and can also highlight this, this idea of, of change. We're now dealing uh, with changing times. But then uh, other shows which I've arranged with artists or uh, estates, um, I've actually rearranged them because um, uh, some of them are not ready. Um, the ones which are, um, it's not really the best occasion for, for them and I've tried to postpone them to the end of the year. So uh, we continue to have a program and uh, in the meantime, um, I think uh, COVID-19, as uh, William was saying, let's give uh, you some new ideas. And I'm also trying to see if I can um, rethink um, the, the gallery exhibition space because now people want something different. And uh, so um, I, want, I also want something different myself from, from artists. I think that's a good time for us to move on to our next kind of topic um, where I wanted us to talk a bit about what our ideas are on what might be the next normal for the art scene both for us in Hong Kong and perhaps if you guys um, have some thoughts on what it might be globally as well. Um, do we think that COVID-19 has really significantly changed the way that we view and experience art in the long term? Um, should we start with Johnson and Claudia? Sure. Okay. Well, long term, um, well, there's hope that it will change things for the long term. And a lot of people have been very optimistic that it will change the world because now we know that the, that, that very exploitative way of living, a uh, very wasteful form of life had not, had not really fared well for, for the globe as a whole. But this is a very big topic. Um, but on the other hand, it is really uh, the art business to, to really um, uh, engage with this big topic in concrete ways. So ha having um, COVID-19, uh, I think does change things in, in a big way. Um, for one, the whole um, economy of, of artworks um, ch has changed, especially in Hong Kong, because um, in the last 10 years, um, a lot of galleries have moved to very expensive um, uh, premises. And just keeping the galleries flow financially, keeping the economy going, um, has been a very big effort for a lot of galleries. And, uh, and that actually has, has, has um, been a change in expense of, of creativity and of, and of art. And I think now people um, will, of course, people who are still interested in very big name artists, 
uh, very um, uh, internationally known superstars. But people now also realize when they go to the gallery, they, they want uh, a, an experience which is different from, say, the auction house or all from the museum. They want to uh, experience things which are fresh. They want, ex they want experiences which are personal. And I think um, uh, after this big reshuffling of, um, of gallery spaces, going to more experimental, less expensive sites, we we'll probably um, urge our old galleries to rethink how they can make their experience more interesting for viewers. And I think that should be um, a great improvement in terms of um, the spirit of being in this business. I, I well, first of all, I, I agree very much with uh, Johnson's view. I would like to add the fact that if we analyze a little bit, like in the past, just looking at the past say, 20 years and the different crises that uh, we went through, starting uh, from 9-11, uh, Hong Kong also was hit by SARS in 2003, and then we had the financial crisis with Lehman Brothers in, in 2008. So there, is, there seems to be like a sort of pattern in, in, in crisis happening that arrived to a stage that obviously we are not ready, we don't expect, but in a way, uh, after the crisis, there is a resurgence, there is a kind of re, uh, a reawakening and, and stand it up again. And it's probably something that maybe arrives in, in a natural way when things are getting a little bit too tight and there is a need uh, to modify something. If it's something related to our way of living, yeah, it could be a reason, but also maybe this business is also, in, in our art business, we find exhaust, exhaustion at some point. The, our, our schedule, we are scheduled for participation to art fairs and art events. It's, it's really crazy. And the rhythm uh, of our lives is really uh, getting very stretched. Uh, I don't want to say that I'm happy that we've been hit by a pandemic, but I just want to say that it's probably um, a good moment where we do have a stretch of time to slow down and really think more clearly uh, where we want to go with this business, where we want to, where we can improve and get our energy to a positive a reaction to it and uh, rebuild, uh, build maybe like even new uh, ideas. Uh, art uh, will be experienced probably in a slightly different way. I also think that uh, what we were used to, uh, to do very easily now will become like a little bit more difficult. Yes, so blue chip artists will probably still be uh, what people may be looking at mostly, but probably we will face and we are already facing uh, the request of very high discount, uh, the old market will uh, eventually is already dropping and probably like in the next six months uh, will be even more. Uh, therefore, we need to be ready in how we want to control that. It's currently, it's maybe difficult to, uh, to have, uh, I mean, if we really wanted to analyze like numbers, I think that uh, we are in a moment where artists whose works are maybe above 100,000 US dollars and below half a million are probably artists maybe in some way we find difficult to sell because um, maybe buyers prefer either to be uh, with uh, the new fresh artists or with the very expensive work that they know they have quite a strong position on the market. Therefore, uh, we need to be uh, quite aware of, uh, of, of this, be um, also inventive, <laughs> creative on, uh, on how we can continue to promote our artists and make uh, the business successful. And live with, uh, with the fact that 2020 is a year of very big economical difficulties and hopefully 2021 will start with, uh, in a better way. I certainly agree about being, uh, this is probably the most innovative and creative I've seen in the art business of late. I do also hope that 2021 will be an upturn for all of us. 
Um, Amanda, what are your thoughts on the next normal? I think everyone said what I wanted to say. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I agree that there needs to be online presence and, you know, we're working on better images, high res videos for all of the artworks um, so that we can give people more of the live experience. But at the end of the day, I mean, standing in front of a piece of artwork is, is going to be like no other um, that no online experience can ever give you. Um, and I truly believe that. Have you guys started thinking about um, going forward, what happens when we start participating in international art fairs again? Can we, are they even going to be open? Yeah, um, I, can, I, can, I can respond to that and, and also kind of pick up on uh, uh, that last question a little bit too. Um, I, think, I think things, you know, here at, uh, uh, at Tessart, obviously we, we've implemented these kind of online things, but, but again, I, I said this earlier, um, I think this is kind of, these are supplemental changes um, and, and will not kind of revolutionize the world in any way long term. Um, I do think there have been important changes that will last though. Um, and I think that there has been a significant kind of culture shift and, and a, a re-engaging or a refocusing on, on certain kinds of things. Um, for interest, I, for, for example, I, I feel like there's been a tremendous shift um, in looking here, at least here in Hong Kong, at looking at um, locally based or regionally based Asian artists. Um, that's something I've seen come back in a very big way recently. Um, whereas kind of before this COVID situation, um, there was still a, a very strong um, influence of, of, uh, of collectors being interested in Western artists. Um, and I think that that might stay. Um, and it's in part because of what uh, uh, Claudia just mentioned, which is this um, financial tightening. People really want to find um, something that has uh, a really great and significant value to them, um, both in meaning and in financial terms. Um, and, and when people really have to stop and think about what they're doing, I think it means they need to be looking locally and at the art that surrounds them and that is responding to their situation. Um, and so here within Hong Kong and the Asian region, um, I'm seeing collectors now really focus on Asian artists um, and, 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 you know, not at high price points. Um, at price points that are accessible and have and, and, are, and are, you know, um, easy to acquire. Um, and, and I think that will be the new normal um, for, for quite some time. Um, and, and we might have to adjust our programs and our pricing accordingly. Um, but uh, that, that, that I think will be an important change that happens. Um, and, you know, I mean, potentially a good one. I guess that's subjective depending on where you stand. But, but I think it's a nice, uh, a nice correction for the market. And I'm thrilled to see that galleries are finally leaving Central. Um, I'm really excited um, that that programs like all 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 of yours. I mean, I mean um, Ben Brown and Hunter TZ and Massimo De Carlo with bigger spaces. Uh, you, the programs you guys have would be just be so so amazing. Um, and and I really look forward to to the day where where you have more space to exhibit your artists and put on really incredible programming. Um, yeah. Do you think that? COVID-19 has changed the way that artists make art? Well, I get this one. <laughs> so I think that uh, uh, artists that are those that out of something like negative or like, uh, you know, whatever surrounds them can turn it into something really amazing. So I don't, I cannot speak for all the artists I work with and I cannot speak with for all artists in this world, but I would assume that not just like a different way, but there is an impact. There is an impact to all of us as a single individual, all of us in our business. So I would assume that there is um, kind of influence or a reaction that artists will have to this uh, situation, whether that would be very straightforward, whether that would be like maybe a little bit subtle, uh, will require time to understand. I don't know, I can answer to this, but I 
I would assume that uh, uh, a pandemic as a crisis will put artists uh, uh, in, a, in a different position from what they've been and naturally they will uh, react to it. Yes, um, well, uh, a lot of people think that COVID-19 would mean that things would change fundamentally from now on. But, or maybe we're not. After all, we had SARS, we had other plagues before, and um, we still have not actually managed to solve um, uh, HIV. So we are really not, um, we, we actually have come through all this and people, people have forgot. And um, when you're in the midst of a plague, um, one feels the lesson is, is going to go down very deep. But as soon as, as soon as, things go back to normal. I think this new normal would be very much like the old normal. However, um, working out of Hong Kong, I think um, what is really going to strike us more um, are consequences of the protests from last year, because it's coming back up again. And, um, and uh, to enlarge on a larger platform, I think this, this kind of protest is really um, indicative of the new Cold War that the whole world is actually entering. And, uh, and that is going to be a much more alarming situation than any um, epidemic. But the, in fact, the positive thing of having um, uh, an epidemic like uh, COVID-19 now is that one suddenly realizes there's also the scourge of God, which is beyond uh, all, any political power uh, that you need to reckon with and, this, and the fragility of, of human body, of course, and also the fragility of uh, any independent economy and uh, political system. So um, perhaps um, Hong Kong getting the, this double whammy of the problem in, uh, here, uh, we, are, we are really at the cutting edge of the new sensibility. So perhaps this is something good for artists. That we're, we're, I'm not passing a buck to artists, but then I'm sure many of them will take this on. I do wonder if, um the situation is really bringing the Hong Kong arts community much more closer together. Yeah, and um, if, I, if I could speak to that. Um, I think, uh, you know, not just artists are responding to this, but as a community, the, the galleries have kind of banded together to respond in a, in a very interesting way as well. Um, next week, the Art Gallery Association will be announcing um, a collective gallery run effort to kind of revitalize the art scene here. Um, and that will look something like an art fair, um, kind of pared down only Hong Kong based galleries, presenting very interesting kind of showcase solo presentations only, a very kind of alternative floor plan. Um, and that's gonna be very exciting and very interesting to see how that, how that pans out. Um, but it is indicative of, of the community rallying together and, and thinking of a creative solution to the current situation. Amanda? I, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> what you're saying, I'm saying what I was going to say. I'm just keeping, uh, I'm just aware of the time and thinking we might uh, start to look at some of the Q&As that have popped up. Um, there's a question here that actually is quite interesting in that considering that everybody is looking at virtual events, um, and virtual platforms. Um, one of our listeners would like to know, uh, will there be more Q and A's or keynotes from the artists that are beyond the viewing experience, beyond the virtual viewing experience? Um, so I guess she wants, they want to see more backstory to the exhibitions. <laughs> huh. Wow, there's a lot of Q and A. Um, I think, yeah, I've, I've always made an effort to try to get my, my artists to um, speak more about their artwork. Um, but, but I think a, an unfortunate reality of that, regardless of how accessible things are online, is that some artists prefer to talk about their artwork and some others, artists do not. Um, and it's kind of as simple as that. Um, you can ask curators to speak and, and I'm always happy to speak about my artists, but that's not always what people are interested in hearing. Um, so I think, I think it is important that, and I think all of us are making efforts right now 
to, to try to do more to present our artists and their artwork um, and their thinking online and other platforms, but sometimes they just don't want to talk. Jonathan, Claudia, you guys have thoughts on this? I, I, do you have any plans to, to do more online interviews or online conversations with your artists going forward? We, we started already, like there is a lot of activities that is happening on, uh, on Instagram. Uh, artists, not really Q&A, but like they, the artists are sharing artists' uh, ideas and reactions as well to the lockdown. And uh, we do have uh, videos, obviously videos that are not of artists in the gallery, but artists in the studios. So I think that that tool it's definitely a tool that we start using more than what we used before. Um, and I assume that that will continue. Uh, we, we start, since we have the gallery here in Hong Kong, we started to uh, always invite the artists showing at the gallery to have uh, a short video that then we public uh, on, uh, on Instagram. And that will continue once the artists will be able to, to travel and, and visit us. I think that's important. My question is now uh, we use uh, online as uh, the only, uh, I mean, the best, best tool that we have to communicate and, and to do our work. And also because our audience has more time available to spend on the screen. I, I wonder whether uh, that would be possible to maintain in terms of like uh, such an audience when uh, life would go back some kind of normal if we go back to the same rhythm, whether it's business, our businesses in the arts or in our business and people will start traveling very much. I, I would assume that uh, perhaps uh, the online uh, views will not be as, as, as much as they are now um, unless a person is constantly on its uh, computer or phone. So that's the kind of, of Thing that probably like naturally uh, there would be a different uh, shift when if uh, there would be uh, a new normal. No, I certainly hope this this new normal you're talking about uh, will, con will continue to stay. Um, this this new digital space is opening up. This new type of social interconnectivity uh, on account of the. Um, of the uh, of the lockdown, um, hopefully it will, it will continue to become part of uh, the normal socializing space that that will continue after the uh, pandemic is gone. But um, from the side of the um, from the, from the side of the artists, I think uh, uh, now if we are if we're talking about this crisis as a as a um, uh, as a reason for for uh, rethinking art, um, certainly um, connectivity of artists, Claudia mentioned, uh, and art being uh, a space of imagination that tries to that attempts and in fact does create um, a wider way of ways of imagining of imagining the world um, in this time of protest and split. Um, I think in a way, Hong Kong uh, on one hand is, is being fractured by this, uh, these protests of different social groups. But on the other hand, because of the uh, COVID-19, people are getting together on, uh, on, a, on a different manner, which bring, brings them to be more sympathetic with each other. So this is actually a very interesting experience in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, art is something that goes beyond fracturing and it's something that actually gives us new imagination. But for the gallery, um, of course, it's also challenging because um, it also um, means that we need to rethink what it means to be a mediator, what it means to be um, a, a, a site of display for artists because the gallery is normally the, the primary site, the first site uh, the artworks meets the public. So um, uh, what William, Claudia, and Amanda has been talking about, the, uh, the, all these new, um, the new types of 
social platforms, they, how they can all merge together to become part of the viewing experience. And whether galleries also will invent new ways to, um, to draw people in to experience art or to draw artists in to experience the gallery space like William's um, residency program, that kind of thing. Um, I think it will force galleries to be more creative. I'm going to move on to our next question. For the majority of collectors in Asia who still favour wall-mounted works and value of the decorative functionality of art, what are your plans to engage and connect with them through the online viewing room or the virtual viewing room? What might be the alternatives to introducing art beyond computer screens and fact sheets? Uh, I'm a little confused by this question. Um, I mean, I, I, my, uh, my collectors are, are, are not so interested in, in, in decorative art. Um, I think a lot of them are, are very kind of committed to the, to the concepts and meaning behind their artwork um, or the artwork that they engage with. And, and that's really what they're interested in. Um, and in terms of, of VR and online rooms, um, I actually have found that, that online, what works best is more decorative art in a, in a, in a kind of counterintuitive way. Um, when we did the Art Basel online viewing room, we did very well, and it was because we showed two-dimensional artworks um, that were for the wall. Um, I think in online platforms like VR, more uh, kind of, you know, non-standard artworks, sculptures even, even sculptures, you know, um, installations, kinetic things, those don't work well online. Um, what does work online is what you, I think you're referring to as wall-mounted and decorative. So it's a, it's a little convoluted answer, but yeah. Now to look at, um, we have another question here. If we think the virtual platform is benefiting or hurting Hong Kong as a leading city in the art industry, have we considered Moving exhibitions online is somewhat removing, go, removing geographical obstacles for many galleries. Huh? Wait, sorry, let me read the question. I mean, I don't think that the virtual platform are hurting Hong Kong. That it's uh, it's an alternative. Is 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 a solution. To, uh, to cover a, a challenge and uh, to continue to, to do um, our work as mediator, as, as Johnson mentioned before. Um, I don't think that uh, it's, I, I would see like an online exhibition as an addition. It's not a substitution. It's a, or probably a temporary uh, substitution, but it's an addition. Uh, and I say that not in the, just in the case of Massimo Di Carlo, where our B space is an extra space, but I, I assume that it's, um, it's, it's for everybody. So it's not that you, uh, I mean, unless, of course, uh, the difficulties of this crisis will force uh, a gallery to close and just to move online. Otherwise, I, I see the online platform as uh, an additional uh, tool uh, to be able to operate. Um, but going back like to uh, Hong Kong and like uh, what the community uh, is doing and what William mentioned uh, it will be happening in June, uh, there is also a, a very important initiatives that was organized by the Hong Kong Gallery Association that invited gallery to exhibit sculptural work at the Asia Society. Uh, I find this uh, uh, amazing, I find this uh, uh, fantastic that uh, uh, most of us, uh, that we could and we had a work, have taken part and uh, extremely generous of the uh, age of society that allowed us to do this and even uh, prolong the uh, exhibition time throughout uh, the summer. So um, there are alternatives that are bringing the community together and are um, 
going down to what on a human level is probably the the best coming out of uh, of a crisis I think speaking of um, alternative spaces or ways that we are viewing art, um, maybe particularly in Hong Kong for us, um, aside from art fairs, the usual art fairs, museums and galleries, do you guys think there will be new types of spaces that will crop up and aside from the digital kind of platform that we've been discussing today? I mean, I think so. I think Johnson's already said he's 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 going to create. A, he's going to be experimenting with his new space. I think uh, the solution right now is experimentation. Um, I I know I'm even planning right now a one week long selling exhibition here at Desart. You know, we will we'll be we're going to be doing a showcase of monumental kind of large artworks by our contemporary artists and showing that for a week to coincide with the auctions. Um, and that's not something I ever would have done beforehand. Um, that's that's totally experimental and frankly kind of flies in the face of like traditional programming But right now why not right now's the time to experiment and to, to, to set new norms and to try to Figure out what what might work better than what had worked in the past um, And especially given that everyone's feeling the pinch a little bit. Yeah Yeah, Okay, shall we move on to the next question? Uh, this is also an open one for everyone. How important is Art Basel Hong Kong to your program? And I guess that's speaking forward on to next year. To our sales. Um, I guess I can take this one. To, I, I mean, Basel Hong Kong is the premier art fair of Asia. I mean, there's no other fair in Asia that compares to Basel Hong Kong. And you get the biggest collectors that come in throughout the world into our tiny little city here um, during those that week. Um, so as far as sales and promoting new artists and our program, it is extremely important. Um, Everyone has a new show at the gallery. We all open at the same time. You know, the gallery association does does gallery night on Monday or Tuesday, depending on when Basel opens, either Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, and so it, it's it's extremely important event for the for the entirety of Asia. Um, and you know, does make up a lot of our of our um, our our financials for the year. But we're still trying. <laughs> so art, art Basel was very important for Hong Kong. It, it draws the art community together in a way no other activity does. It, it brings collectors here, it brings the international collectors here, and it brings the, um, the world of uh, galleries together in Hong Kong. So. Um, it is very good for Hong Kong to have such an event. Um, it also fits the character of, of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is, a is a place that has always um, um, thrived on the exchange of goods. It's a place mm -hmm. where people transit and they stop over. So um, it has actually made use of, of, of the best of the, uh, the ethos of Hong Kong. And, uh, but of course, um, it also um, brands Hong Kong as a commercial center over a creative center. But I think given the, the, the exposure of, um, of local artists to the international galleries, to the international visitors, is actually encouraging art to, uh, to, to come out and, and, uh, and exhibit and show themselves. So um, it is another channel for art which is not uh, for artists that cannot afford to become part of the uh, Art Basel Hong Kong um, exhibitions to to share some of the some of the, the excitement and to have um, to, and, to, and to allow the art to shed light on the international world of uh, galleries and collectors. So it, it is a, as we've been uh, very very important for 
for giving Hong Kong a different status of art. And of course, we have something else to look forward to. We, we know that um, M plus is opening up and um, M plus has a very strong um, uh, uh, Asian focus. Um, so it has, a, has the um, promise to be a regional museum. So, um, so Hong Kong can become the locus of a lot of um, activities and a, a, a lot of, um, well, it can still become a focus if, if things turn out to be right. Thank you. I'm just aware of the time. I think we've run out of time to get to all the questions. Um, so I'm just going to wrap this up. And I think what we've got out of this talk is that we're seeing a lot of optimism for Hong Kong and for the Hong Kong art community and art scene. Certainly these past few months have got us all thinking very experimentally and innovatively. You know, without a doubt, the Hong Kong art scene, it's, it's growing rapidly. It's ever more vibrant and we're seeing more evolving grassroots spaces coming up, a diverse network of commercial galleries and art hubs sprouting throughout the city. Very evidently like Wan Chok Kang um, that we've been talking a lot about tonight, as well as many spaces popping up along the Kowloon side. Um, and then, you know, recently with Victoria Harbour, we're seeing the newly opened K-11 Museum and the newly revamped Hong Kong Museum of Art. Um, and then next year, as Jonathan just brought up, we're very excited waiting for M plus to open. Um, so I think we really have a lot to look forward to going ahead. Um, and I'm excited to see where this all goes. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to thank all our speakers today for all your wonderful insights and your generous time. A big thank you to Art Power Hong Kong for inviting us and organizing this talk. And lastly, thank you to all our uh, listeners who joined us today.